All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Savvy Chat, our series on Savvy's core values. And I'm really excited to actually really have this as our, our last one that we're talking about, which is elevating others and how important this is. And so I'm super excited that we're joined by Terry Wilcox of Patients Rising to help us talk about this. Because Terry's the co-founder and executive director of Patients Rising, and they're all about helping empowering patients and getting them the tools and access they need so that they can really manage their own care. So before we dive into all of that, Terry, uh, you know, I want you to be able to say hello and welcome yourself and let us know where you're calling in from tonight. Hello, um, everyone. My name is Terry Wilcox, as uh, Jen just told you, and I'm calling from Vienna, Virginia tonight, which is about 20 miles outside of D.C., so I... I do, in fact, live in the swamp. But, uh, it's not so swampy tonight. It's feeling actually pretty nice. I can feel fall. So I know. Fall is finally upon us. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, like I say, I couldn't be more excited that you're here and you're going to be talking about something so important about elevating others. But before we kind of dive into what you do at Patients Rising, you know, you have a really interesting background in, in relation to how people get to where they are. And I was looking at it and, you know, you're coming from a background working in video and in media. So, you know, that kind of signals to me that if you're really somebody who cares about storytelling, well, tell me how you got into that. And is that really right? Are you interested? and sort of, you know, helping people share their, their story? Um, no, it, it definitely is. I mean, storytelling has always kind of driven me, even though, you know, I, I went to school for theater and I did theater for a very long time. And, and I lived in Los Angeles and I was an talent executive and I booked celebrities for award shows. And, I, you know, so I've always had a really creative sort of background, I guess you could say. And, um, about, gosh, it's been 12 years ago now, I got started in, um, in the storytelling space for cancer patients. And I left a job that was really kind of stressful at G4, which was a video game network, which was sort of hilarious since I didn't play video games, <laughs> except for Pac-Man. <laughs> so, but um, I did get a lot of storytelling chops there in that job. And I really had a passion for it. And so this was the first job that I had outside of that. And I worked with um, a cancer clinic out of Memphis called uh, the West Clinic. And I went all over Arkansas and Tennessee and Louisiana and Mississippi and talked to cancer patients. And I really wanted to do a television series around cancer patients called Understanding Cancer. And everybody we talked to was like, we don't want to do a cancer patient storytelling show because they all die. That's what everybody said. Um, that's really not the case now. It's so exciting and, and innovation, but that was what was told to me. And so we were like, okay, well, I guess that they, they want to, you know, obviously they want uplifting stories. And so after that, I then met um, my mentor, Selma Schimmel at Vital Options, and she was doing um, Cancer Talk Radio. And radio was kind of dying at the time. I don't know, but I guess it was about 2007 or eight when I met her. And I said, tell me what we've got to do video. And so we started doing, you know, that's what we started doing. We started doing um, video programming and um, interviewing not just pa patients and doctors and everybody. So we got more into, we did a lot of clinical video work, but we also did a lot of storytelling work. And one of the things that I always, I stayed in this space because I actually get a lot of, um, I get a lot from the patients and I think patient stories are completely where it's at and storytelling. And as a matter of fact, I tell people all the time, I'm like, I can write and I can say stuff and I can get up and talk. I'm like, but really the patients out there who are, who are using, um, you know, who are, who are living with chronic and life-threatening illnesses, basically, who are, you know, using healthcare to the maximum who have more, you know, records and appointments and things than any of us can possibly imagine, those people telling their stories, both good and bad, can make change and can affect people and can teach people. And, you know, I can relay that as somebody who works in the industry. And, you know, my dad is a, is a patient, um, a multiple patient, lots of comorbidities. I just found out another one today. But um, anyway, so that is where I got into um, 
the storytelling space. And you were right about that. So it's been about 12 years. Wow. And I mean, you kind of touched on that of like what you were seeing as you sort of dipped your toe into the, like the healthcare space and, you know, wanting to champion those patient stories. But when you think about that, like what did you observe about storytelling in healthcare before you entered the space? And, you know, you talked about wanting to make some of these cancer videos or otherwise, was there a need for it? Was it happening? Was it not happening well enough? Or how, how were you kind of interacting with it? Well, it really wasn't happening. And I think that in some ways I was kind of before, I'm sorry, I'm going to silence my other computer that wouldn't talk to us. <laughs> All good. Sorry, making that loud noise. Um, no, I actually thought that the storytelling was kind of non-existent in the space and it wasn't really happening. And honestly, the place that it needs to happen, there, there aren't a lot of nonprofits that are really set up. You don't say I'm going to start a nonprofit so that I can do storytelling. Yeah. But the fact is, is storytelling is everything to your nonprofit, whether it's healthcare or not, quite frankly. But, but there wasn't really anything that was really showing, showing, you know, what these people were really going through, yeah. how things were affecting them and how the system affects them and how, you know, what's happening in their own state and how they're, what's going on with their family. And we interviewed people from all walks of life, literally from rural, rural, rural Mississippi to, you know, Memphis, you know, lower, lower parts of Memphis to, you know, upper middle class, we, we, the trajectory of people, we just interviewed store, we, we got a lot of amazing stories, and, and a lot of really great um, stuff from people, but there wasn't really anything like that going on. And I actually pulled in a real, you know, a journalist to sort of help me do it, actually, you know, to sort of help put it together. And before we, yeah, we kind of go more into that, like, I want to talk about what Patients Rising is so that our viewers kind of really understand what you guys are bringing to the table. Because I think that's really interesting, as you talked about, there weren't really any other organizations out there to have a platform for patients to share their stories. But tell us about what you guys do. Um, patients Rising, I always say my elevator pitch is, is that we focus on access, innovation, and regulatory reforms that support access and innovation which I know that sounds really, you know. So in terms of like those being what your, your elevator pitches, like let's elaborate and kind of break that down a little bit. So when it comes to access, like how are you helping patients there? Um, well, the, there's a, several ways that we help patients, but the main way we help patients is to do things like we have our how to be your own best advocate book and we do workshops, all you know, different workshops and, and um things all around the country and we help patients um, in that way learning about the access issues that they're experiencing. We also try to bring in other patients to that to give a real world analogy to it. Meaning it's one thing for me to stand up and say, you know, this is what a copay accumulator is and this is what a step step therapy is and this is what this is and this is what this is. And I can very well do that. But it's much better to have real life patients who've gone through it, who can really talk about the experience that they had um, with their insurer or whatever. We do also have a hotline that we don't advertise, which is sort of an interesting thing. We're only three years old, and I guess I didn't say that in in um, you know in talking about our organization. It was founded in 2015, but we do have a hotline that we've been testing, and we're actually hoping to be able to hire a full time person to manage it and grow it because we really want to make it, make that hotline sort of a concierge service um, for patients to direct them to the best places to go for, you know, clinical trials, for access, for all of those things. Um, and so we focus, we have two different organizations. We have our 501c3, which completely focuses on access, which completely focuses on education and support for patients. And on the 501c4 side, which is our Patients Rising Now, we focus on ab our, ab that's where our advocacy and our policy book happens, so. Yeah, so tell me more about kind of all of that. And like you said, you do more than just storytelling. So 
let's kind of dive into that because again, you guys are not a traditional advocacy group and it took me some time to understand like all the different things that you guys do. So you talked about access and the, the hotline that you're developing out, but break it down a little bit more for us. Definitely. Um, so I'll break it down. I'll, I'll start with Patients Arising, which is we have four specific programs. Our signature program is called Voices of Value. We start, we launched with Voices of Value right out of the gate. That was the first thing we did in 2016. And that, that was basically story, patient storytelling. I mean, that's what we did all year. We went all over the country. We did um, meetings in different locations with patients from all sorts of disease groups, because we are not a disease specific organization. Um, and Voices of Value is still our signature program. But now we focus it pretty much on our blog. We, our blog is Voices of Value. And the goal for our blog is to get 50, is to get five um, patient writers in every state by 2020. We have about 22 states covered. My real goal for that, you know, in the perfect scenario is to sort of, is to kind of have a mini patient um I don't want to call it media, but kind of a patient army of, of that will report on things in their states. I want to find patients in every state who are interested in working with us to report on state specific stuff, because I say that healthcare is local. I've always said that. And because it is what's happening to a person in Alabama is going to be a completely different experience than what's happening to a person in Massachusetts or Montana or anywhere else. And so to have those types of patients, to have patients in that region and focused on that state. I mean, that's amazing. And something that I, I don't see out there and that I wish we had more of. So that, that's, that's that program. And that's, I think it's really important for people to understand that you do so much policy work, which is why it's important to have that sort of local representation. Yes. That's one of the reasons that we, that thank you for that, because that is one of the reasons that, um, I did um, say that is because the policies in every state are different, uh, you know, and that is why it's, you know, healthcare is, healthcare is local because we're, you know, the policies in every state are, are different. And, you know, Massachusetts has basically, you know, healthcare for all and <laughs> Florida doesn't and et cetera. So, so you can understand that, but that is why, that is why that focus and why are, you know, we really are looking at a state by state, um, the ability to support that way. And that's one of the, you know, the voices of value from the patient voice we think is a really strong way to go as rather than just having a bunch of information on our site, but having constant updated stories. Um, we will have, a, we do have a bunch of information on our site, but, but we think that that is a, is, is a way that we can really have, um, you know, patients be able to connect with each other regionally. We, we hope to be able to start groups for each state and things like that on Facebook or wherever. We're going to test some of that out next year and see how that goes. Just, we feel like when people can connect in any way, we, we think it's, it's, it's a good thing and that they, you know, patients within each state can really learn from each other in that space. Yeah. Um, people like smart patients and can't, you know, there's lots of groups, but I feel like a lot of those groups are really focused on um, the disease which is important. You know, you, you want to learn what others are going through it with the same disease as you, but you can learn a lot. An arthritis patient can learn a lot from a cancer patient about policy stuff. Yeah. About and that's what I think is really interesting about what you guys are doing because like Savvy, you are what we consider disease agnostic. You're working across conditions. And so, you know, we get people asking us, you know, why we did that. And, you know, is there a reason? And for us, it's, yeah, we want to create best practices around working with patients so that, yeah, if you're working with an arthritis patient, you're going to, they're going to be treated the same if you work with a, a cancer patient or an MS patient. And so from your standpoint, and you made this decision to not be disease specific, why did you choose that? model and you know does it have to do with with state stuff is it working on policy or what what kind of drove you to do sort of that agnostic model as well well the main reason that we chose that model is that we were, were really interested in the policy of, of care yeah. and you know some people say that uh you know some people some people and i also looked at the space I had worked in cancer a long time and it was a pan cancer organization, meaning it 
didn't focus on any one certain type of cancer, but it was just vital options, which I worked at before was just cancer. Um, but I always felt from a policy perspective, from an access pers perspective and from, you know, clinical trial registration perspective and all the things that were of real interest to me um, were much better in this space. I didn't, I didn't feel like I, there was no one specific disease that I wanted to focus on. I felt like that was sort of out there for most things. Um, and this just, I felt like we could do a lot more and accomplish a lot more as this type of, organ, as, as, as an organization that that's not focused on any one disease. Now we do do disease specific stuff as, as you guys do, if you have certain, you know, um, things there are projects that come your way, but, but we do them all around our core mission, which is access innovation and regulatory reforms that support access innovation. So it always focuses on that. We won't just go off in left field for no reason. And that's what, you know, I, you kind of touched on too, like there are other groups that are out there doing the disease specific stuff and it's super important. And I personally am grateful to those organizations that supported me along my sort of journey. But you know, we're talking right now about like the programming that you're doing to help sort of elevate the individual patient and help them be a better advocate for themselves and their community through the policy work that you're doing. But there's an aspect of elevating others that relates to the other groups and kind of on that organizational level. So I'm curious, sort of your thoughts, like obviously we know that healthcare has tons of silos and I think that advocacy groups, there's no exception there either. So I'm curious, sort of what are your observations now, having been at this for several years and working across these conditions about what you're seeing about how organizations are currently working collaboratively to solve some of these problems? Um, certainly there are other groups that are working in policy as well. So do you find that people are coming together or what sort of challenges or advantages are you seeing around this and collaborating? Um, collaboration is always, yeah, I mean, we do, we do on state initiatives and things like that. I mean, we sort of have to, oftentimes we'll, there will be a leader group that'll say maybe write the, not, or write the legislation or put the legislation forth or sort of lead everything and other groups will come in around that. I, I, I think that that we, we do that quite well, especially on state policy stuff. We're able to sort of come together in that way um, fairly, you know, fairly quickly and easily. I don't always feel that in those group things that there's a real connection. Sometimes I, I, sometimes I still feel like it's a little disjointed and we're all sort of not necessarily on the same page. And I'm not sure how to fix that because it's really hard to run a nonprofit. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not, it, I, I don't think, ex except for the larger organizations who don't really need the mid-level organizations like Patients Rising or any mid-level organization. I mean, if you look at, at any big, big national organizations such as American Cancer Society or, you know, uh, national uh arthritis foundation or diabetes, you know, if you look at the really big, you know, landmark, you know, organizations, I mean, it's harder to work with, you know, it's harder to work with those. It's, I have much better collaboration with, with, with people more my size. It's sort of like, you know, people more, more kind of in your, um, in your bandwidth. Cause I feel like there's a different sort of ability to work together um, in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think many of us in the space see that we actually have a, a comment coming in from one of our viewers that's asking the same sort of thing. How have you connected with more disease specific groups? They say I found myself spinning or with my head spinning on a swivel because it can be challenging. So I don't think that it's any secret that sometimes collaboration is hard. And so this may be difficult to answer, but do you think that there's room to improve these collaborations? And, any any ideas on how we can do that? Because there's so many of us organizations that are out there trying to you know help patients, but how can we be helping each other and elevating each other as organizations so that we can in the end serve patients better? Well, one of the things that I think that we can really do is is the one thing, and this is our core stuff is is access. The one thing that I think every organization and and we can all come together around access because I always say, you know, 
there's another organization out there that likes to say, you know, um, so, what is it? Drugs don't work if patients can't afford them. And I say, drugs don't work if patients can't access them <laughs> either, <laughs> you know? So, um, and, 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 and it goes both ways. I, I, both statements are true, but I think that there are things around access that we can all, if there was like a group, like a core group of, of mid-level groups that really wanted to just focus on these issues and even have, you know, look across the states, see where we, see where we can come together on these things and share each other's patient stories. See, we have a lot of bandwidth for patient story sharing. We have a lot of bandwidth for guest bloggers of patients. We, 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 our blog is very heavily, it's very heavily read. We've post a lot. We do a lot. I mean, there, there's lots of ways that I think that if we wanted to form a, a core group of, of organizations to do something like that, that we could really um, elevate, not elevate the storytelling that each of us have, because as organizations, we each have really great stories, right? We each have, you know, and if we're all out there pushing that, we can make, you know, we can affect change and, and make change. And because, you know, as as um, I've had a very wise uh, congressperson tell me that um, it's like you can come in our office and tell us your story all day long. But if you don't give us something to do, we're not that smart. <laughs> like, you know, we we need something to do with your story. Like, what do you want? And so I think that is one of the things that we could really we could really come together on. I mean, I've. I, I can't volunteer myself here on this call, though I would love I, I would love it if other people wanted to do that because it would I mean it would even if even informally just to see where it would go I, I think it would be a really good idea. Yeah, well, I mean I think that's so great because if we could be partnering and collaborating more, we just could we could get so much done and or at least accelerate it. So that's what like what's your dream if we could all come together and be working more collaboratively? What do you think that we could accomplish if we actually elevated each other's mission? Well, one of the I mean, one of the big things that I think we could really accomplish is we could we could help more patients. I mean, and isn't that all what we're trying to do anyway? I mean, I sure hope so. <laughs> I sure hope so, because that's what I get up every day and I think about and how, you know, we're going to to get all of this done and how we're going to, you know, work together. And one of the things that I see and I sometimes is I see organizations who uh, want to create want to want to want to recreate the wheel of everything that's out there already rather than I, I just feel like even when we're looking at Patients Rising University, when we first started, and I didn't even get to talk about Patients Rising University that much, but that's okay. It's our educational platform. Right. And when we first started looking at it, um, we were like, okay, we're going to write these courses, and we're going to put them up, and we're going to, you know, that's going to be great. And people are going to learn all about these policy issues and how to pick their health plan. And then we were like, I watched some stuff, and I looked at some learning management systems, and I was like, oh, no, we're going to take our time a little bit. We're going to slow down because... Um, I want people to watch it and I want it to be useful and there's a lot of good stuff out there. And why do I need to make it again? Like, you know, like there's a lot of really good information. Um, and I just, so I, I think that there's a lot, I mean, we're going to have a university and we're going to be pushing it out there and we're going to be doing all kinds of webinars on this stuff, but I'm looking at like triage cancer who does really great, you know, programs for, you know, how to pick your health plan and all of these things. And AIMED Alliance, who does really great, you know, talks about advocacy from a legal perspective. And there's so much wonderful information out there. And how can we all bring as much of our information together as possible and share it? Because a lot of us have really good programs that sit unwatched and unviewed because maybe you don't, maybe that, maybe this organization who made this amazing thing doesn't have the bandwidth to get it out into the world that maybe if they shared it with five organizations that were, you know, that kind of did that or were a little more social media savvy, it would be out in the world. So I, I think that there's so much stuff like that, small stuff. It's like, I tell people, I'm like, you have something really great. Send me prepared tweets and send me stuff. And I send everything to my social media guy and he's just great. I mean, he just does it and that's wonderful. And we try to share as much stuff like that as possible. But I'm like, do some of the work for me in the fact that, you know, and, and I'll help you get it out. We'll help you get it out there. 
Yeah. Well, obviously I couldn't agree more and that's why we're having this conversation with you in particular just because, you know, we really need to be working more collaboratively and not seeing each other as competition, but really the end goal is the patient. And I think people think about how, you know, industry, pharma, other healthcare companies might lose sight of that, but it's important to like check ourselves and realize that we as organizations can sort of lose that focus too. And just kind of, yeah, recalibrating and remembering if we work together, the patients are the ones who win. So I think that's super important, but you know, our viewers are not just companies, they're not just organizations, they're, they're real people, they're real individuals. So, but be it a patient or a healthcare you know, professional that might be watching that doesn't have their own company, so they can't make some of these large decisions, how can they implement sort of this mindset on their own, on their individual level? They're going back to work tomorrow. How can they help sort of elevate others in just their day-to-day -day life? Um, I mean, one of the main, one of the main things that they can do to help, you know, to elevate others and to help other patients and others around them is to just share of share themselves, yeah. you know, be open with their own story and with their own, uh, you know, journey and their own, you know, the own, their, their own, the own, uh, their own pitfalls and, and triumphs that they've, that they've gone through. I think that is one of the most helpful things you can do for, the, for, for anyone else is, is sharing yourself, yeah. being open to doing that. And, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You know, I think that, I think we try to, sometimes we try to overthink it or we're scared to say something. And the fact is, if you're just honest and, and, and talk to people, most patients um, want to hear more, want more information that I know. And if they don't, then, you know, you be respectful and they'll tell you. But I mean, I think helping, helping people around you and, and sharing your story and sharing your story anywhere that you can, if you're willing to, I think is just, if you have the kind of story, I mean, and for us, it's very specific. We, we specifically want to hear access stories. Um, you know, I'm sure that if you're doing a story for, you know, longevity or, or, um, any other organization, you know, a disease specific organization, they're going to want something a little bit different that, that weaves that in, but we really want to hear the struggles that patients have had and overcome or try to help them overcome them. A lot of times we get, you know, patients who will write us about insurance stuff and we have like a lot of information that we send them right back and try to help them navigate it. So. Yeah. That's, that's so important. You guys are doing such a terrific job and, I am so glad that you were able to kind of help our, our audience understand more about what you do and, and making sure that patients know that they can go there and they can share their story on a local level. They can get some educational material on, on how to do that and be a better advocate and get involved in policy. So that's amazing. And we're so excited that you guys are here in the space and, and just doing your part because I think that's the best any of us can do is just to continue to contribute what we have to bring to the table and then work with others that are doing amazing things like yourself. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, before we finish out, of course, we have our rapid fire questions that we like to ask our guests because we want to make you guys more human too. We all have other things that happen outside of our busy lives at work. So, you know, when you're not being savvy and helping others at patients rising, what, what occupies your time? What are you doing? I have five-year-old twins. That's occupying all your other time. Yeah. My, my in-laws, my in-laws moved in on September 14th and I have five-year-old twins. That sounds like a busy house now. Hopefully they can help a little bit, maybe. Yeah. My mother-in-law has been cooking breakfast. It's been kind of awesome. So yeah. Amazing. Hey, any help is welcome. So, yeah. <laughs> well, so speaking of like kind of those things, what are, what's something quirky about you that people might not necessarily know? We all have our little hidden Hidden talents. Hidden, my little, I don't know if it's a hidden talent. I mean, I, I was born in Hawaii, I, which I'm not Hawaiian, but you know, my, I was born in Hawaii. I should have been born in Texas because that's where my parents were from, but my dad was in the Navy. Oh, okay. I, I, uh, and I like chicken and dumplings. And I once did yoga for 60 days in a row and it was the best shape of my life, but I haven't done that since. Before was my it sounded like past tense. No more. No, I do yoga, but I haven't, I mean, 
it was actually, I finished doing my, it was actually 68 days on the mat and I blogged about it and I wrote about it. And I, then literally the, after I finished, I, um, got pregnant with my boys. And now I imagine doing it with twins that that's like advanced, but I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're five now. They're crazy. Yeah. Uh, they probably put you in your own sort of yoga poses with all the things that they're running around doing. Oh my goodness. They run me ragged, but I love them. Obviously. But yeah. Obviously. Well, that's awesome. So, I mean, this is kind of a loaded question since of course, uh, talking about healthcare and all the things we have to solve is part of what you do day in and day out, but kind of narrowing it down. What is one of the biggest healthcare headaches or challenges that you personally think we have to address? The biggest healthcare thing to address at this point, in my opinion, is patient out-of-pocket costs. They're skyrocketing. They're crazy. Um, you know, they're doing all kinds of things with copay accumulators, and I could go into policy chit chat all day long. But they're they're doing. They put all kinds of roadblocks. Premiums are high. Coinsurance is high. Deductibles are high. Seniors can't use coupons. Seniors can't use this. They have to, it is really a mess in the sense of insurance design. And we want to bash, you know, prices and list prices. And I'm all for lowering list prices. I mean, you'll never hear me say, don't lower list prices. I mean, that you won't hear me say that. Um, of course, lower list prices, but there's no guarantee when you lower a list price that it's actually going to really help the patient out of pocket costs in the end. What is that? exactly mean. And so I am 100% focused on how can we make better insurance design and better care design for patients so that they can limit their out-of-pocket costs um, because they're that's what's really hurting, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And like you talked about, access is is a whole different sort of thing too than costs. And um, you know, what can we be doing to create a system that's allowing patients to get the treatments that are out there. So cost is certainly prohibiting that. Yeah. Our, my other favorite question that I give everybody a little bit of uh, prep time for, because I know it doesn't come naturally always, of what song title you think best describes the current state of healthcare? So I'm super excited to hear what you picked. Well, I have two. Ooh, great. We'll add them both. It don't come easy. My Ringo, Ringo Star. Excellent choice. And I want a new drug by Huey Lewis. <laughs> okay, which one is that? I want a new drug by Huey Lewis in the news. <laughs> That's actually an excellent selection. I know <laughs> when you find those like perfect titles. That's amazing. Well, for those of you who don't know, we have a Spotify playlist that all of these songs go on, our Savvy Healthcare soundtrack, which you can actually go and find if you go to savvy.coop slash savvy dash soundtrack. And you can see all the awesome selections. We have things now from Ringo Starr and John Lennon and Cardi B and Bon Jovi. And we have an oh, that's great. I'll have to listen to it. Yeah. I didn't, know, I didn't go to it before I was like figuring that out. So. See, you, you picked it originals, but yeah, it's kind of awesome. All the different ones that people are coming up with. So hopefully they can motivate us to continue to do our best to, to help move things along and, and make a better system that truly is putting the patients at the, the forefront of the innovations that we're creating. Well, those are my questions, but before we end, certainly, you know, you guys are working on a lot. What can we help sort of plug for you here? What should we tell the people listening that you're working on? Well, I just, I, well, there's a couple of things. Our patientsrisingu.org is our Patients Rising University, which we're going to be rolling out our, our new courses and clinical trial design and other things. And I talked to you about possibly doing one. So I would love, um, for people to register for updates for that if they're at all interested in sort of what we're we're doing over there and anyone who has an access story or wants to blog or has a partnership that they would want us to consider we are we are very very open to to that kind of i mean obviously we want to hear stories but we're very open to you know working with others and 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 supporting other organizations and obviously patients in any way that we can Amazing. Well, that's exactly why we love you guys. You're really great partners and we look forward to working with you more. So 
That, my friends, is the end of our series on our Savvy Core Values. Please take a moment to go back and listen to our other amazing guests and other individuals like Terry, rock stars in their fields, talking about transparency and diversity and inclusion and patient centricity and how to be a better company. There's a whole series that we hope that you guys will go back and check out. And this now will lead us into October. And October is National Co-op Month. And if it has not already become apparent, Savvy is a co-op. So we're going to be really talking about what does that mean? I know a lot of our members even want to know more. How can they get involved and how can they learn about co-ops? So next week, we are joined by Nathan Schneider and Jason Weiner, who is our fabulous lawyer and Nathan is a professor at the Colorado University of Boulder and they're going to be chatting with us about co-ops. They're two of our sort of pioneers in the space on how tech companies can be co-ops. So they're going to be joining us and that's going to be an awesome sort of kickoff to our co-op month and we've got lots of other exciting stuff coming up. So please stick with us on our savvy chats but i want to thank you terry for taking the time i know with two five-year-old twins it can't be easy to join us on a sunday night but i thank you our viewers thank you because you contributed so much to this conversation about elevating others well thank you very much thank you thank you yeah awesome well i hope everybody else has a wonderful sunday evening and we will catch you next week so take care everybody and stay savvy